Hello, I'm Mr. Eliason, and welcome to APUSH. Today we're going to continue our study of the early American period here by diving into Washington's presidency. So as we just ratified or have almost ratified the Constitution, it's time to get into the administration of our first president and all the various precedents that he set and the ways that Washington shaped the American political process moving forward. So let's dive in. Here are our objectives for today. Take a moment to take them in, and then we'll dive into our narrative here. So the, president, the first presidential election in American history was uncontested. Washington, you, weren't, you didn't run for president in those days, but he was, everyone understood when the Constitution was written that Washington would be the first president. This was one of the things that assuaged the arguments of the anti-federalists who were concerned about a powerful executive because the American Cincinnatus himself would be the first president and no one was concerned that Washington would try to make himself into a king or a ruler. His political, everyone's understanding of his political position was strong enough that everyone was confident that he would be a great president. So every state voted for him, except New York, who didn't appoint electors, and New York and Rhode Island, who had yet to ratify the Constitution. But again, it didn't matter, because it was obvious to everybody that Washington would be president of the United States. As president of the, president of the United States, Washington set a variety of precedents that would hold as strongly as law for most of American history. For example, despite the fact that Washington was a military leader, during his role, his time as president, he dressed in civilian clothing, setting the precedent that, again, although the president is commander-in-chief, he is commander-in-chief as a civilian and not as a military leader. He also established the precedent of a yearly address or letter to Congress, which would eventually turn into the State of the Union. This is not written in the Constitution. It's something that happens informally, but is, again, custom almost as strong as law, and it would be unthinkable for any president not to give a yearly address. Washington also created the cabinet system, which is also not written in the Constitution. Washington's first cabinet was his Secretary of War, Henry Knox, his Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, who handled domestic affairs, and his Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson, who handled foreign affairs, kind of. The roles of these cabinet officials were not clearly defined in the early years, and in the end, Hamilton would be the force behind most of Washington's presidency. He also hired an attorney general, but uh, not an official part of the cabinet, so although in the picture, cabinet member, not really. Washington also established the precedent of running for, of being president for two terms. He was again elected unanimously. You can see all the states have finally gotten the process together at this point and have chosen their electors. But when it came to seven, Washington was originally going to step down in 1792, but he was talked into running again by James Madison. Uh, he already had a farewell address drafted and all that, but he decided to stay on for a second term. But he would choose to not run for a third term, setting the precedent that a president should only serve two terms, which would hold all the way until 1936. Domestically, Washington embraced Hamilton's vision for the United States, following Hamilton's economic plan. This is a five-point plan which would attempt to build the United States into a manufacturing mercantile country to rival Great Britain by creating a national debt and absorbing state debts, creating a national bank in order to hold the nation's finances, issue credit, and eventually hopefully create a profit, and pass a protective tariff on European products in order to protect domestic manufacturing. An additional part of this was a whiskey tax, which was passed to pay down debts. And so those five parts are Hamilton's economic plan. And this is the thing that the ant former anti-federalists and the Jeffersonians would clash with Hamilton and Washington about. This exposed rifts within Washington's presidency and would eventually lead to the creation of two political parties, although not quite yet. Jefferson was the strongest, argue, was the strongest, uh, was most strongly against the National Bank, quote, <clears throat> giving a distinct and independent power to do and act as they please, which might be good for the Union, would render all the preceding and subsequent enumeration of powers completely useless. It would reduce the whole instrument to a single phrase that instituting a Congress with the power to do whatever it would, whatever it would for the good of the U.S., and they would be the sole judges of the good and evil. It would be a power to do whatever evil they pleased. Basically, the elastic clause 
if used in this way to create a national bank, because of course the Constitution does not directly say that a national bank could be created, but Article 1, Section 8 says that in Article 1, Section 8, it does say that Congress shall have the power to do all things which are, quote, necessary and proper. Is chartering a national bank necessary and proper? Well, if you ask Thomas Jefferson, it's not. But if you ask Alexander Hamilton, it is. Quote, the relation of a bank to the execution of the powers that concern the common defense has been anticipated. It has been noted that this very, that the, that this very moment the aid of such an institution is essential to the measures to be pursued for the protection of our frontiers. So we need a bank in order to do the things that the Constitution gives Congress the power to do. In the end, Hamilton had to convince enough people to go along with his economic plan to get it passed. And the, negoti the secret negotiations, which we don't have records of, the story is that Hamilton and Hamilton, Jefferson and Madison sat down. And in exchange for Madison helping Hamilton pass his economic plan, Hamilton agreed that the capital would be moved from New York City down to a new city on the Potomac that would be called Washington, giving this center, giving the South this sort of centrally located capital, was enough for was enough for Madison to get the votes to pass Hamilton's economic plan. So, but that doesn't necessarily mean that Madison and Jefferson were on board, and this divide would continue to create the first two political parties, the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. The most controversial part of Hamilton's economic plan, of course, was the Whiskey Rebellion. Farmers, especially in the frontier areas, one of the ways that they could get surplus, get actual hard currency, is by distilling their excess grain into whiskey and selling it. And this tax on whiskey would hit these farmers uh, most severely. Farmers in western Pennsylvania decided it was time to take up arms to stop this, and so they put together militias, started tarring and feathering tax collectors, started shutting down courts, and it seems like you've got a little Shays Rebellion going on here in western Pennsylvania. Unfortunately for the rebels, while during Shays Rebellion, Massachusetts could ask for help, but there was no one there to enforce the laws, now we've got someone to enforce the laws. And so Washington raised an army and led them part of the way out to Pennsylvania, the only time in American history that a sitting president has led troops in battle. With the, when the risky rebels discovered that Washington and the army were coming, they decided to lay down their arms and establish a compromise. The Whiskey Rebellion fell apart quickly, unlike Shays' Rebellion, demonstrating that the Constitution had enforcement powers that the Articles lacked, and that you couldn't just raise, you couldn't raise up your own army in order to avoid federal law. The other thing that the, that the Constitution allowed us to do was now raise tr money and troops in order to finally deal with that whole Native American problem in the Ohio River Valley. Native Americans had been pushing back against the series of treaties that were signed, arguing that they were completely unjust because they included only one group of Native Americans and not all the various groups negotiating together. Specifically, specifically the Treaty of 1784, Native American groups did not agree with this last purchase here and were pushing back significantly for, reason, for the reasons that, again, they were not consulted and the land given up was far greater than what the Native Americans who signed the treaty should have had the ability to do. And so Washington here is going to, uh, is going to try to negotiate with Native Americans. Here's his letter where he brings in Native Americans like Joseph Brandt in order to try to demonstrate that we can resolve this peacefully. But in general, the federal government is never going to tell Western settlers that they have to get off the land. One of the reasons we fought this revolution is to be able to push westward past the proclamation line. And so these treaties are going to have to be recognized one way or the other. The Northwest Indian War is a massive fiasco for the United States. We send an army under Josiah Harmer into the Ohio River Valley where they, a contingent of them are absolutely crushed by Native Americans led by Little Turtle. After this, the U.S. Army is forced to withdraw in defeat. So a year later, we create a second army under a general named St. Clair, and this goes even worse. Before St. Clair can even engage the enemy, the Native Americans attack their camp, kill most of the troops, and steal all their supplies. These two, these two devastating defeats at the hand of little, hands of Little Turtle convinces the U.S. government that more care and planning is needed if we're going to effectively be able to defeat Native Americans in the Ohio. And so we spend a significant amount of time creating and training an army under the command of Mad Anthony Wayne, a Revolutionary War general. 
he's going to he's going to advance much more carefully, make use of various Native American groups as, as scouts, and at the Battle of Fallen Timbers is going to defeat Little Turtle and his forces. After this, we're going to push, uh, the Native Americans are going to sign what's called the Treaty of Greenville, signed at Fort Greenville there in the southern part of, uh, of Ohio, which cedes the area you can see on the map here to the United States and establishes that the rest of the land will be reserved for Native Americans. We're also, after this battle, going to push towards a policy of assimilation again, again encouraging Native Americans to take up farming, to assimilate into Native American society, to give up their traditional ways of life in order to be more smoothly integrated into the United States. This doesn't, we don't get wide scale pushes for assimilation until Jefferson's administration, but it's a shift in general away from extermination and towards, again, some sort of negotiated agreement. The other crisis that Washington has to deal with is the whole French Revolution thing. At this point, revolutionary France and the so-called Batavian Republic are at war with all of these countries in Europe. And so the question is, now that the king is dead and the French Revolution is in, high, in, in full swing, do we continue to support revolutionary France? Does our, is our eternal treaty of friendship with France still in effect, even if the king who signed it is dead? The Guinea affair brings this, uh, brings this conflict into sharp relief. Uh, Charles Guinea was a French representative of the, was a representative of the revolution. He came uh, to the United States in order to try to secure aid, establish privateers, things like that. He came into the South and was greeted with fancy parties and all this sort of stuff. And as he came northward, he started low-key encouraging Americans to uh, get involved in the French Revolution. Washington didn't want this to happen. He was worried that this would drag us into another war with England. He didn't want us to get tangled in European affairs. And so he refused to allow the arming of privateers. Genet started arguing that they should do it anyway. And Genet started trying to rile up crowds in order to uh, overthrow Washington uh, and then establish a more revolutionary state within the United States. This absolutely, utterly failed. Jefferson ends up uh, resigning over this whole deal. And it led to a massive crisis uh, within the administration. But there was no revolution. The people did not rise up and overthrow Washington. And by, the, and by this time, the French Revolution had already finished. The Girondins had been liquidated from the National Assembly. And the French ordered Guinea re recalled to be uh, probably tried and executed. Guinea then resigned his post, and Washington magnanimously allowed him to stay in the United States, despite all of his previous sort of uh, uh, treacherous uh, underminings. The other problem that we were facing was that both French and British sailors were attacking, our, both French and British ships were attacking our, our trade and uh, were conscripting our sailors. And so Washington attempted to, uh, to pass a declaration of neutrality, but both sides for the most part ignored it. And it was pretty clear that these French revolutionary wars were going to drag us in one way or the other. But Washington did his best to navigate us through this whole thing. And he signed a treaty with England known as Jay's Treaty, which didn't really resolve any of the key issues, but did normalize relationships with the British. So here's Washington explaining, quote, my opinion respecting the treaty is the same now that it was, namely not favorable to it, but that it is better to ratify it in the matter that the Senate has advised than to suffer matters to remain as they are unsettled. Madison says that, uh, quote, it was hardly imagined that we were so soon to grant everything to Great Britain for nothing in return and to make a part of this bad bargain with her that we should not be able to make a good one with any other nation. And so the argument between siding with the British and their coalition versus revolutionary France is going to be one of the key dividing lines in the creation of the two political parties. And so Jay's Treaty and the signing of Jay's Treaty leads to a, a, a larger rift within the formerly unified Washington administration. Uh, here's John Jay being uh, burnt in effigy for not getting anything in exchange for Britain promising not to attack our ships. And we sign a treaty with Spain at this point where we, uh, get, we formalize the border between Florida and the lower southern states. All of these issues lead to the creation of the first party system, which we're going to spend some time with tomorrow once Washington rides off into the sunset. So keep in mind, economic issues and England and France are the two major divisions between the faction that's in being increasingly led by Hamilton and then the other faction led by Jefferson. 
Here's Jefferson's opinion on Jay's treaty, basically arguing that uh, they need to now start joining together politically, create political parties, and resist Hamilton and, to a lesser extent, Adams. The final issue that we try to deal with is the Barbary Pirates. So as we talked about previously when we were talking about the Articles of Confederation, now that the British Navy is no longer protecting our ships, and now actually actively attacking our ships, many of our merchants are being attacked by pirates stationed in North Africa. These Barbary states are taking American ships, stealing the cargo, and holding Americans hostage. So in response, we have a Coast Guard, but of course a Coast Guard is not particularly good at protecting American ships in the Mediterranean. So in 1794, we signed the Naval Act, creating six frigates which will eventually make up the core of our Blue Water Navy. Obviously, it takes time to build ships, so you know we're not ready to use them yet. But when we get to the Barbary Wars, we have a Blue Water Navy because of the Naval Act of 1794. So with Washington ending, the, ending his second term, he decides not to run again again. And this time, he can't be talked out of it. He drafts a farewell address, mostly written by Hamilton, where he, you know, says, of course, that he's going to step down. He warns Americans against political, pi political fighting, uh, political partisanship, the creation of political parties, which, again, at this point, he's not speaking to Jefferson and just referring to him as that man. So I think that ship has sailed. He argues against foreign alliances, which, fair, I guess, but it's going to be hard to keep that one. And then he argues against sectionalism, you know, basically seeing a bunch of the problems that are eventually going to face the United States, arguing against them, and then, of course, we're just going to totally ignore him and do all those things eventually. Here's a piece of Washington's farewell address. You should probably just go read it in its entirety. It's one of the key documents of American civic religion, and so you should probably read it all. But, I mean, it's just straightforward. This is his, quote, the, rule of, the, rule, the great rule of conduct for us in regard to foreign nations is in extending our commercial relations to them with as little political connection as possible. So far as we already have formed entitlements, let them be fulfilled, fulfilled with perfect good faith. Here, let us stop. Europe has a set of primary interests which, would not, which to us have none or a very remote relation. So stay out of Europe as much as possible. Trade with them, but no alliances. That's a powder keg that could get us dragged into massive conflicts that would be incredibly bloody and unpleasant. So again, prescient. So that brings us to the end of the Washington administration. Uh, with, uh, with Washington gone, uh, we're going to see who can step into the shoes left behind by the great man and who can guide our country in the years once Washington sails off into the sunset. Thank you for listening.